good day and welcome to PFG's Fiscal Year Q2 2020 Earnings Conference Call. If you would like to ask a question at the conclusion of the prepared remarks, please press the star key followed by the number 1 on your telephone keypad at any time. I would now like to turn the call over to Bill Marshall, Vice President, Investor Relations for PFG. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Lori, and good morning. We're here this morning with George Holm, PFG's CEO, and Jim Hope, PFG's CFO. We issued a press release regarding our 2020 fiscal second quarter and first half results this morning. The results discussed in this call will include GAAP and non-GAAP results adjusted for certain items. The reconciliation of these non-GAAP measures to the corresponding GAAP measures can be found at the back of the earnings release. You can find our earnings release in the Investor Relations section of our website at pfgc.com. Our remarks in the earning release contain forward-looking statements and projections of future results. Please review the cautionary forward-looking statement section in today's earnings release and our SEC filings for various factors that could cause our actual results to differ materially from our forward-looking statements and projections. Now, I'd like to turn the call over to George. Thanks, Bill. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our call today. We are joining you from Southern Florida, where we are hosting the annual President's Meeting with our field leadership organization. Over the past few days, we have discussed our vision for success, and I am thrilled with the level of excitement across the entire organization. As you know, our company has been busy growing our legacy business while expanding in the new channels and territories through acquisitions, including E.B. Brown and Reinhardt. Today, we will provide an update on how these initiatives have progressed. We also look forward to speaking at the Cagney Conference in a couple weeks where we will provide more detail into our vision and strategy for PFG. But first, I'd like to start by reviewing some highlights of our second quarter business results before, before providing a quick update on the Reinhardt acquisition. Jim will then discuss our financial results and annual outlook in more detail. And then finally, we will be happy to take your questions. Let's turn to our results. After a strong start to the year, we're pleased to share that our sales and EBITDA growth continued in the second quarter of fiscal 2020. Total case volume increased by 6.7%, driven by the E.B. Brown acquisition, a 4.9% increase in independent cases, and growth in performance brands. We are pleased that our independent case growth for the quarter continued in the mid-single-digit range, which was in line with our expectations. We believe we will be able to achieve our long-term objectives with this level of independent case growth in our legacy business. As we look ahead, we expect Reinhardt's level of independent case growth to be below the mid-single-digit range in the short term, but will accelerate over time to be more in line with our legacy business. We continue to believe the overall health of independent restaurants remains strong and will continue to be a key driver of our long-term profit growth. As you know, we closed the Reinhardt acquisition in late December, completing the transaction by the end of our calendar 2019 uh, physical quarter two. We're excited to add the Reinhardt business to our organization and welcome the many talented Reinhardt associates to the PFG family of companies. Reinhardt brings over $6 billion in annual net sales, taking PFG's annual revenue run rate to approximately $30 billion. The transaction increases our food service division's scale, distribution platform, particularly in the independent channel, and market density. Over time, we expect this to improve our network efficiency, reduce mileage, and create additional sales opportunities as we share best practices. We're also excited about the cultural fit between PFG and Reinhardt. Both organizations go to market with a focus on success at the customer level. We believe that we will be able to enhance Reinhardt's operations and increase the combined company's depth of differentiated private label brand offerings. The increased density of our combined sales associates will also enable more face time with customers and should reduce future operating expense. Reinhardt also brings a diverse customer base, including independent restaurants, healthcare providers, education, and other attractive end markets. We believe that these strategic merits will strengthen our combined business and increase shareholder value over the long term. While we are just over a month from the completion of the transaction, integration is going very well and we are pleased with the progress that has been made bringing these two great companies together. 
Each quarter during these calls, we like to highlight one associate who goes above and beyond to serve our customers and colleagues. Today, we'd like to recognize one of our new associates joining the PFG family from Reinhardt. John Hayes is a shuttle supervisor based out of Columbus, Ohio. He has 30 years of experience in food service, including time as a driver, lead, and driver trainer, and has been a supervisor for the past eight years. When PFG and Reinhardt announced the acquisition, John was quick to contact all of his drivers and met with key customers in the Columbus market. His efforts have ensured that both customers and drivers are in tune with Reinhardt's transition to PFG. His level of enthusiasm, commitment to success, and overall positive attitude are an important reason why we continue to win in the Columbus and Dayton areas. Whenever two companies the size of PFG and Reinhardt come together, there are significant amounts of work that need to take place to ensure a smooth transition. It is stories like this that give us confidence in the future success of our company. I'd like to personally thank John and all the associates who put in hard work every day to make our company great. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Jim, who will give you more detail on our second quarter results. Thank you, George, and good morning, everyone. Our second quarter results were strong, <clears throat> with net sales and EBITDA growing nicely. Total case volume increased 6.7% for the second quarter compared to the prior year period. Underlying organic case growth was 0.7% in the second quarter. Net sales for the second quarter of fiscal 2020 improved 31.5% compared to the prior year period to $6.1 billion. The increase in net sales was primarily due to EB Brown and sales growth in Vistar, and case growth in food service, particularly in the independent restaurant channel. The acquisition of E.B. Brown contributed approximately $1.3 billion to net sales for the quarter, including $267.3 million related to excise taxes. The increase in net sales was also attributable to higher selling price per case as a result of inflation and mix. Overall food cost inflation was approximately 3% in the second quarter, especially in the center of plate items, such as cheese, meats, and poultry. <clears throat> Gross profit for the second quarter of fiscal 2020 increased 15.7% compared to the prior year period, 711.2 million. The strong gross profit increase was led by recent acquisitions, as well as case growth from an improved mix of customer channels and products, specifically in Vistar's channels and to the independent restaurant channel. Gross profit per case was up 39 cents in the second quarter versus the prior year period. Gross profit margin as a percentage of net sales was 11.7% for the second quarter compared to 13.3% for the prior year period. The gross margin decline was driven by the addition of EB Brown, which has lower margins due to tobacco sales. Operating expenses rose by 16.5% to $630.7 million in the second quarter, compared to the prior year period. The increase in operating expenses was primarily due to the acquisition of E.B. Brown, an increase in case volume, and the resulting impact on variable operational expenses. Operating expenses also increased in the second quarter as a result of increases in personnel expenses. EBITDA increased 13.8% to $124.5 million in the second quarter, and adjusted EBITDA rose 22.2% to $142.9 million compared to the prior year period. Net income for the second quarter declined 4.4% year over year to $41.2 million. The decline was primarily the result of the $10.4 million increase in interest expense, partially offset by the $7.5 million increase in operating profit. The increase in interest expense was primarily the result of additional debt issued to help finance the Reinhardt acquisition. The effective tax rate in the second quarter was approximately 24.2% compared to 23.4% in the second quarter of fiscal 219. Diluted EPS declined 4.9% to $0.39 cents in the second quarter over the prior year period. 
an adjusted diluted EPS increased 9.4% to $0.58 cents per share over the prior year period. Please note that PFG's definition of adjusted diluted EPS now excludes the effect of intangible asset amortization expense. Please see this morning's earnings press release for GAAP to non-GAAP reconciliations and restated adjusted diluted EPS for prior periods. Let's turn to our second quarter results for our two segments. Net sales for Vistar increased 135.6% compared to the prior year period to $2.2 billion. This increase was driven by the acquisition of E.B. Brown and sales growth in the segments of corrections, vending, and office coffee channels. Second quarter EBITDA for Vistar increased 24.7% to $56.6 million versus the prior year period. Gross profit dollar growth of 49% in the quarter was fueled by the acquisition of E.B. Brown. Our food service segment generated fiscal second quarter net sales growth of 4.8% to $3.8 billion. The customer-centric focus and strategic investments in people and technology drove EBITDA growth of 8.9% in the second quarter. Turning to our cash flow in the first six months of fiscal 2020, PFG generated $157.8 million in cash flow from operating activities an increase of $87.8 million versus the prior year period. The improvement in cash flow from operating activities was largely driven by higher operating income and improvements in working capital. For the first six months, PFG invested $49 million in capital expenditures, a decrease of $11.1 million versus the prior year period. PFG delivered free cash flow of $108.8 million an increase of approximately $98.9 billion versus the prior year period. I'd like to briefly comment on Reinhardt and the impact we expect on our financial results. As we have previously disclosed, we expect to achieve approximately $50 million in annual run rate synergies in the third full fiscal year, which represents our fiscal 2023. We will act prudently to integrate these two companies and expect to ramp to our 50 million target fairly consistently across the first three full fiscal years. Savings will come predominantly from procurement opportunities with a balance from operations and logistics. Also, as you consider your model, we wanted to provide some insight into Reinhardt's business seasonality. Given their geographic footprint, which skews more towards northern U.S. compared to PFG's legacy business, Reinhardt's profit contribution will over-index during our fiscal fourth quarter and fiscal first quarter and under-index in fiscal 2Q and 3Q. Specifically, approximately 60% of their EBITDA is realized from April through September, representing our fiscal fourth and first quarters. Reinhardt's EBITDA contribution is lowest from January through March, representing our fiscal third quarter. Turning to our fiscal 2020 guidance, we increased our adjusted EBITDA growth outlook to be in a range of 27% to 33%. The new range includes contribution from EB Brown and two full fiscal quarters from Reinhardt. Fiscal 2020 adjusted EBITDA, excluding Reinhardt, but including EB Brown, is projected to grow 13 to 16 percent versus our previously announced range of 10 to 14 percent. PFG also updated its fiscal 2020 adjusted diluted EPS guidance to a range of $2.17 to $2.28, representing growth of 2 to 7% compared to adjusted diluted EPS of $2.13 in fiscal 2019. As previously noted, all past and future adjusted diluted EPS figures, including the guidance range, excludes the effect of intangible asset amortization expense. This guidance is based on the following assumptions for the full fiscal year 2020. Organic case growth in a range of 3 to 5%, which excludes contributions 
from E.B. Brown and Reinhardt. Interest expense in a range of approximately $115 million to $120 million and an effective tax rate on operations of approximately 26%. PFG also expects capital expenditures to be between $180 million and $200 million, with depreciation in a range of $175 million and $185 million, and amortization in a range of $65 million and $75 million. In summary, our second quarter fiscal results were solid. We're pleased with the consistent top-line growth in our businesses and the strong EBITDA results for both our food service and Vistar segments. We continue to feel confident that PFG will deliver another year of strong growth, and with that, we'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you. At this time, I would like to remind everyone, if you would like to ask a question, please press star, then the number 1 on your telephone keypad. If your question has been answered and you wish to remove yourself from the queue, press the pound key. Your first question comes from the line of John Heinbockel of Guggenheim Securities. Hey, George, can you uh, maybe talk to another two unit for a month? Um, what do you think the cadence of uh, investment in Reinhardt's uh, sales force uh, will be, and then the timing of or the progression of independent case growth? You know, is it uh, is it a two year time frame to get to uh, close to the mid single digits? Is it is it longer than that? Uh, thoughts on on both would be great. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't expect it to take two years. Uh, I don't want to underestimate what's involved here, but I wouldn't expect it to take that long. Uh, we certainly need to make some investments in people, and uh, you know, to a degree, uh, some things are just about how they approach the marketplace. Uh, it's basically what we expected. It's a very well-run company that's just struggled to grow, to grow that top line, particularly an independent. And uh, we feel, as, as we put the the right uh, number of people in place with the right training, that that we'll get there. And the, what we plan to do is continue to give our uh, organic uh, independent growth until we have lapped the Reinhardt uh, sales. Uh, we know we have some some work to do around making sure that we align exactly what, what uh, we've always reported as an independent customer uh, to do that with their numbers. And then once we get through that four quarters, then we'll be putting out just our uh, organic growth as we always have. And, and you think you, you would get their sales force, uh, the, the growth in their sales force up to what, uh, five or six percent in the next nine to 12 months or, or not that high? Uh, probably not that high, but certainly, certainly at least three. We, we do have a situation where their average salesperson does a fairly significant amount of business less than ours. So we feel just getting people up to uh, a higher level of, of weekly sales themselves, kind of the equivalent of adding people. So uh, we're confident right. there. And then, and then just lastly, the um, the implied second half uh, EBITDA guide, right, is, is below, you know, your historical algorithm, right, which has been more high single digit. Is is there a reason for that, or is that just because you know we're only we're only six months in, and you know we've, we've got a, a potentially weather impacted third quarter in front of us? Yeah, that's that's exactly right, John. Well, look, we feel good about the guidance range we've provided today. Um, as, as I mentioned, the prepared remarks, Reinhardt's smallest quarter from an EBITDA contribution standpoint is our fiscal Q3, uh, so some of the impact is seasonality. And, uh, and you, you know this, you always look at a two-year stack on, on Q4 for us. You're right. Okay, thank you. You know, I, I should mention another thing that's not necessarily seasonality, but uh, we have a stub period coming up of six months, and uh, I've I found in acquisitions that uh, typically people have uh, a higher level of earnings in that last month of the fiscal year, uh, part of it reconciliations, but a lot of it growth programs. So we we do expect um, that when we get into next fiscal year, uh, a little weaker from a comparison standpoint, uh, fiscal second quarter, just trying to get ahead of this uh, for Reinhardt. 
but a stronger fiscal fourth quarter for Reinhardt as, as we get these programs to match up from a uh, fiscal year standpoint. Your next question comes from the line of Edward Kelly of Wells Fargo. Hi, guys. Good morning. Hey, uh, so, George, if I look at, um, you know, total organic case growth this quarter uh, was a little soft. Can you provide a bit more color on what occurred here, um, what you're seeing in January? And then you maintain your full year outlook for 3 to 5%. You're running at about 2 right now. So, can you bridge us as to as to how you um, you know still achieve that three to five? Yeah, um, you know a, a zero point seven real growth is certainly not where we wanted to be. Uh, although the quality of that growth was was very good, um, what we saw was a, a weak uh, December in theater. Uh, part of it being uh, kind of the product that was out there, and part of it being one less week between Thanksgiving and Christmas, which is typically the, you know, the peak for theater going. Um, we also saw in that same period of time some real weakness in some of the casual dining chain business that, that we do. And we also saw some weakness in value stores, and more of that uh, was us having one less market with our largest value customer. Uh, but obviously, you know, the earnings held up extremely well, and I think that speaks to, you know, the quality of the growth that we did have. We also saw some inflation, which helped us, but we saw increased average case price in independent go up uh, more than we saw the inflation. So, uh, on a 4.9% increase in cases, you know, that we ended up having a 9% increase in sales. So, I think that helped us a lot. Um, we have a good pipeline. Uh, the, the people that run our two main businesses are confident in that pipeline they have, so we elect it to, uh, to keep that 3 to 5%. We have seen in the month of January things go back to this kind of pre-unusual holiday period. We try not to get too encouraged with anything in January because it can be so weather-related, and we really haven't had weather issues, but I will say also we didn't last year. So uh, we're encouraged, but we just try not to, to put too much into how things go in the month of January. But I think when we get through our physical Q3, we'll have a much better idea how the year is going to develop. Okay. And, um, you know, I also wanted to ask you about case-level profitability performance. So let's call it gross profit per case. I mean, you seem to be doing really well, so it's almost like a silly question. But it, can you talk about XEB Brown? Um, what what's happening with gross profit per case? Um, how are you doing with the pass through of inflation? You know, there was a large peer of yours who sort of called that out, which I think surprised everybody. Um, and then what you're seeing generally in the competitive environment and how it's just impacting it all. You know, I would say that. Uh, when it came to dairy and meat, we probably had similar difficulty passing it through. What helped us is that we just had such a, a good mix of business, and it was the high case cost items, which come with sometimes lower margin, but more gross profit per case. And that's where uh, our heavy growth was. I don't think it's probably any more complicated than that. Um, but it, it is a little bit more inflation than, than we would like to see in the industry. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Kelly Banya of BMO Capital. Hi, good morning, um, George and Jim. I guess as you look at your, your core uh, food service fleet now with, with Reinhardt, um, granted only a month in, I'm um, just curious if you could talk a little bit about capacity, your own capacity. Are there pockets where you see opportunity to add or maybe have too much? And then also from a competitive standpoint, um, do you see any changes in terms of competitors building out uh, capacity in certain regions? Well, we would always like more capacity, and um, certainly we uh, have many things in the pipeline and many things that are being constructed right now. It just seems to be a slower process than it's been in the past. As far as competitors adding capacity, we don't see too much of that. Uh, I know there's a large one going in, in, in the Midwest area, a large facility. Uh, there's a large one going into 
uh, kind of the southeast Gulf area. And then we also have a competitor that's putting a large facility in Denver. So those are only three I know. And uh, but those are all three big projects. Okay, and then maybe just um, another one just on, on wages. Um, from a lot of the data we track, it seems to have stabilized, but, but still seems to be growing at a healthy pace. Um, I was just curious if you could comment on, you know, what you're seeing on that front, how you feel about the investments you've made over the last year or two on delivery and warehouse personnel, but also how your your core restaurant customers are dealing with and um, dealing with labor and and turnover and, and how that's impacting their business and, and I guess, in turn, uh, your business. Yeah, Kelly, it's Jim. I'll take the first half about our, our labor, and I think George will take the second half about customers. But um, as, as you recall, uh, almost two years ago, we, we really did a, a very important and good job of making sure we had our driver and warehouse wages where they needed to be and, and representing the marketplace. And since then, I think we've, we've found our sweet spot and um, from a labor cost perspective, I don't expect anything unusual coming forward other than the typical standard uh, approach. And I think we're in, we're in a, a good place from a labor wage rate management standpoint. So that's, that's the way I'd look at it. And then George will address the second. Yeah, with the customers, it's something I ask everyone on my talk to because I think they're getting hit both ways. And that's where uh, they're dealing with more inflation than they're used to. Uh, in the product, and of course, you know, we all know how difficult the wage part of it is. And I just simply ask them, what is the biggest problem of the two right now? And the answer is almost always wages. Um, and I think it, it, when we get past this, it's probably good for the industry because, you know, today the, the, there's decent sales growth in the restaurant industry, but there certainly isn't traffic growth. And I think that people are or our customers are very smart around how to get menu price increases, uh, you know, without it just being a blatant, these across the board menu price increases, which don't seem to work very well. But when they've got both of those things to overcome, I think it's difficult. Um, and, you know, I think we're, we're dealing on, on a higher end of the wage scale than they are. And we made our adjustments fairly aggressively when we needed to. And I, I think it's much harder for our customers today, unfortunately, than it is for us. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Chris Mandeville of Jefferies. Hey, good morning. Um, Jim, the call it 2 to 3% EBITDA guide, X Reinhardt, is there any ability to further break that down in terms of the drivers of the increase and then if I recall correctly, we spoke about this last quarter, but I'm pretty certain you guys had a third cigarette price increase in this current quarter. So if that's the case, can you break that out in terms of contribution as well? Yeah, on, on the second half of your question, we did not see a, a cigarette price increase and, and uh, don't really know, frankly, how to expect one or to expect one, but we, we don't factor that in. And um, and Chris, thanks for the question, but uh, the guidance we provided in, in the prepared remarks is the, really the, the uh, level of detail that we're going to provide. Okay, that's fair. Um, and then I guess my follow-up would be just with respect to fuel surcharges and, and costs. As pricing has come down pretty considerably lately, can you just remind us of maybe of the, the timing of impact that relates to gross profit versus OPEX and what percentage of your needs are, are currently hedged out? Yeah, you know, look, I'll tell you, we we work to do some hedging, and uh, it's it's certainly not material. Um, we think we do a pretty good job of staying on top of the prices and staying in front of it. And to some degree, there's a little cost of doing business involved in the diesel pricing. Um, you know, I, I just I don't see it as something that uh, has a material effect on on the results and the fuel surcharges. We're, we we manage those very closely and very strictly, and and uh, that's I think that that's not an important part of how we we manage our business and our P and L. It's more about making sure we have the right price to our customers. And uh, you know all of that surcharge goes into margin, so it can be a little bit deceptive when that goes away. Uh, internally, we always look at it as an offset to fuel prices. So. 
Okay. Thanks, guys. Our next question comes from the line of Judah Frommer of Credit Suisse. Hi, thanks for taking the questions. Uh, maybe first, just uh, kind of a housekeeping item, Jim. Does, does the earnings accretion from the deal change at all with, with the new definition of EPS backing out the amortization or, or kind of the, um, the impacts you gave for the first couple of years are the same? Yeah, look, as, Judah, as you know, we're, we're just a month following the close of transactions so far, uh, we mentioned integrations going well. We sure do feel good about the deal, very good about the deal. Um, we gave you some color on our expectations for 2020, including Reinhardt for the two full fiscal quarters, and next year we'll do the same for 2021 to help you with your model. Uh, as you would expect, things will move around for all our businesses, and we uh, aren't actually going to provide an update on the accretion math but will focus on our current fiscal year metrics and results and, of course, provide an update on how Synergy Capture is progressing. Okay. And, and so maybe just dovetailing on, on the synergies. George, can you help us with, obviously, the $50 million run rate is, is cost synergy. Um, just kind of kind of general timeline to get at revenue synergies, maybe specifically private label uh, or anything else along those lines. Well, I think it'll. It's one of those things that'll just build. Um, we got, you know, we have some work to do to to get them in a position to grow the way we would like to see them grow. I think it'll probably take us a couple quarters to to start to ramp that up. But I think it'll be pretty consistent then for a couple of years. Like I said, it's a, it's a very well run company. It's just a matter of getting a little bit different type of sales culture. Got it. Thanks. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1. Your next question comes from the line of Jeffrey Bernstein of Barclays. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, George, I think in your prepared remarks you said um, you know, restaurant health remains strong. Um, just wondering if you can maybe contextualize that for us. I know, you know in the industry people talk about lackluster comp growth, you mentioned the, the challenge from a traffic perspective and significant cost inflation, both labor, as you mentioned, and commodities. I'm just wondering, um, you know, how do you kind of think about the, the health of the industry? And I mean, maybe you're talking about chains versus independence or QSRs versus casual dining, just trying to assess your view of the restaurant industry in that context. Well, I think casual dining is, is still struggling, but, you know, like you would expect, there are some out there doing well and people can do well. Uh, still in that business. The reason I think the industry is strong is that they've got a lot of headwinds to go against, particularly what we talked about. There's some inflation, and there's certainly wage inflation, and yet, you know, the industry is continuing to find a way to grow their top line and a way to keep traffic pretty steady, and I think those are good accomplishments, and I think it bodes well for the future of the business. Okay, and then... Um... You know, Jim, from a commodity standpoint, you guys mentioned inflation of about 3% in the second quarter. That's up modestly from the first quarter. And now I guess it's at the very top end of the 2 to 3% comfort range you talk about in terms of being able to pass along to customers. Just wondering whether you think that this level is now someplace we're going to hold steady or you think of the past two quarters as relatively steady or maybe you think we're at the start of an upward trend. I know you talked about dairy and meat and others have talked about the same thing. So would you expect inflation to continue to creep higher outside of that 2 to 3% range? Well, look, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't think any of us do. And um, look, 3% is certainly we're, we're very comfortable passing it through, as you can see with our margins. And the margin results, uh, frankly, we can we can pass through in, a, in any range between and up to four percent. I think we can make that work. Um, I'm not I'm not too concerned about it, but uh, we're definitely going to keep our eye on it. We won't underestimate it, and we keep our sales force very in tune with what's going on in the commodities market. Understood. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Marissa Sullivan of Bank of America Securities. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Um, I guess I just wanted to, to touch on the uh, the Reinhardt um, acquisition and some of the comments you made previously about instilling a, a, a sales uh, growth culture at uh, Reinhardt. Can you just talk about what you've done, I guess, over the last few uh, weeks and kind of what's, what are your priorities for, for the rest of this uh, fiscal year? Well, you know, we've spent our time talking to people and learning. 
there's certainly some excellent salespeople there, and they just haven't had a, uh, I, I guess I would say a system in place that, that put a high priority on growth. Um, they, the last several years have basically been kind of the same, you know, the same type of sales, the same type of earnings. And I think it's, you know, you just have to change a culture a little bit, but the people are very willing. We have them all here right now. And um, a lot of them are people that we've worked with in the past. And we're, we're just confident that as we get uh, some product changes, and you know, not anything earth shattering, uh, a little different approach to to the marketplace and uh, get some more people on board, I, th I think we'll be in good shape. Gosh, and then if I could just uh, follow up on, on independent case growth. Um, can you just parse out a little bit where you saw the growth coming from this quarter? Any any changes um, in terms of, of penetration or, or uh, new customer wins? And, um, and yeah, any additional color would be great. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I would say for us, it's 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 more about new customers than anything. But that's normal. That's probably most of the people in our industry. You got a fairly high turnover in restaurants. Uh, we're certainly not penetrating as well as we would like to see. But when traffic is flat, and you are penetrating, I, I guess you can look at that as an accomplishment. But for for us, the biggest thing that that we seem to be able to continue to improve is just the loss of business. It continues to to go down. It's not huge quarter to quarter, but over time, it's gone down significantly. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'm showing no further questions. I'll now return the call to Bill Marshall for any closing comments. Thank you for joining our call today. If you have any follow-up questions, please contact us at Investor Relations. Thank you for participating in PFG's fiscal year.